Well, um, thank, thank you for that. Can you, can you hear okay at the back with this? Is this one working Are we close well? enough? Yeah. Yeah. Move, move, close. Yeah. move closer. All right. Um, so, yes, um, I, sometimes it's important uh, at things like this to be clear about names and pronouns. Um, I'm Dominic, so I, and I prefer he and him. And, and I'm Meg John, and I prefer they pronouns. Okay, so we're going to... Yeah. We're going to talk about sex addiction. We are. You're going to start it off, aren't you? I am. Yeah. Yes. Well, we were going to start off to talk. Uh, we're just going to uh, introduce the kind of structure of the of the talk. Then we're going to do something a little more interactive to start with, and then have a bit of a talk, and then Q and A. So what we're going to cover is we're going to cover what is sex addiction. So I'm going to do a little bit of a history of um, the term and where it comes from. Uh, then we're going to look at how it's being criticised as a concept, um, and Dominic's going to cover that bit. Um, and then what we're going to do is put forward two kind of alternative ways of looking at it. Um, one is the Braun Harvey and Vigorito sexual health model, which Dominic's going to present because I don't actually know much about that one. Um, and then I'm going to present a tentative set of ideas around ways of which I think I could, that I, I would like to work with it, both in um, a kind of self-help way of working at, at, with it and a way that might be applicable to therapy, drawing a bit on mindfulness and a bit on existential therapy as well. Mm. Okay. Um, so be before we get into the talk, it, we thought we'd, we'd start with um, that what is sex addiction and, and start with that questionnaire that we've handed out at the beginning. And hopefully you'll all have a copy of it. Um, and you don't need to have filled it in as such, but um, I'm going to just kind of critically deconstruct those questions uh, so that you can get a, rank a ranking for how many you would tick, because I'm assuming that you will be able to tick some of them. Um, and so the first one, does your sexual behaviour have a negative impact on other areas of your life, such as relationships, work, finances, health or professional status. Um, and what that's, what, what's behind that, I think, is uh, do you pay for online memberships uh, for, for uh, either porn or for um, apps, dating apps uh, or sex apps? Do you ever need sexual health checkups? And I think, given it's World AIDS Day, this is quite an appropriate thing, because if, if we are sexually active, we should be going for sexual health checkups. Do you ever go to sex on the premises places? Do you use social media to chat when you're at work um, and to maybe flirt? Are you putting Tinder on? Does your partner ever object to you not being at home? Uh, would your colleagues judge you if they knew where you were and how you conduct your sex life? So see if you can, you know, whether you would take at least some of those points. Does your sexual behaviour contradict your personal values and potentially limit your goals in life? And I would think about, do you, do, you think, do you feel it's okay to have sex with partnered people? Or do you always check that the person is sexually available and single? Do you always ask people their relationship status if before, you, before you have sex with them? Do you always um, ask their HIV and sexual health status and the date of their last test? Um, when you are, and when somebody last had condom loss, condomless sex. Have you tried to limit your sexual behaviour or stop it altogether, but failed? And what that's about is, have you tried not going online as much? Not checking the apps during the working day, for example. Um, or for as long as you do, um, to cut back on the time that you're using, your, the, amount, the amount of time that you're spending online. Um, or the amount of time that you're engaging in sexual activity you have solo, like using porn or otherwise. Are you, are you more tempted to engage in sexual behaviour when you're experiencing difficult feelings such as a stress, anxiety, anger, depression or sadness? Like, do you ever have sex to make yourself feel a bit better? Do you ever masturbate to make you, change your mood or comfort yourself to get yourself off to sleep or change your mental, mental state if you're feeling stressed? You would be answering yes to that. Are you secretive about your sexual behaviours and fearful of being discovered? So with this we'd be thinking, does your partner and family know about your sexual interests? Have they seen your porn? 
Have they seen your sex toy collection? Do your close friends know what you like to do sexually? Well, if they don't, you can be ticking yes to that. Um, do you feel dependent on your sexual behaviour and struggle to feel fulfilled with any alternative? And I'm thinking here about, do you, do you prefer to have sex over other, past time, other pastimes and recreational activities? Have you tried to distract yourself by going to the gym more, or walking, or reading a good book, rather than masturbating? Um, have you noticed that you need more and more stimuli, always in order to achieve the same level of arousal and excitement? And so behind that is, have your tastes and sexual interests changed over the course of your lifetime? Does it take you longer to achieve an orgasm now than it did when you were in your teens? Are you as easily aroused as you have always been? Do you find yourself struggling to concentrate on other areas of your life because of thoughts and feelings about your sexual behaviour? And so the question behind that is, would, would be, do you have trouble sometimes concentrating at work because you're horny? Can you concentrate on your conversations with your friends when you're out socially without noticing other attractive people around you? Do you ever want to flirt with the waiter or the shop assistant? Number nine, have you ever thought that there might be more that you could be doing with your life right now if you weren't so driven by your sexual pursuits? So do you resent the time that you spend having sex or pursuing sex and wish you could write that novel that's inside of you instead? Do you feel as if your sexual behaviour is out of control? And we're going to talk a bit more about that one in a minute. Do you currently have... What, uh, do you currently... What have you in the past struggled with any other addictions, um, or compulsive behaviours or eating disorders, such as drugs or alcohol or compulsive gambling or gaming, playing lots of computer games, work or exercise? So, you know, do you collect figurines or stamps... Have you ever had an OCD, <laughs> spent long times on the computer playing, playing a computer game for extended periods with friends? You know, that's kind of compulsive, they would be seen as compulsive behaviours. Finally, has anyone in your current family currently or in the past struggled with any addictions, compulsive behaviours or eating disorders such as those listed above? Really? No one in your family? <laughs> come from any of those, got stuff up with any of those problems. And I think what that's doing, if you, you know, and, and it's, this, is, this is the questionnaire from Paula Hall, who's one of the UK's experts on sex addiction. And she says, quote, if the answer to more than half of these questions is yes, then someone is likely to be struggling with sexual addiction. There are strong feelings of if there are strong feelings of ambivalence, this may be because someone is still in denial of their problem, or that they may be, it may be that the difficulty is just mild. So it speaks to severity there, and this chart kind of helps us think about the questions of severity. So have you, over the past six months, how often have you engaged in compulsive sexual behaviour, so frequently, occasionally, or mildly? Over the past month, how often have you fantasised about your sexual behaviour? Over the past month, how often have you struggled with intrusive thoughts and feelings about sex? And, and then the severity. What behaviour what, what behavior impact does your behaviour have on your everyday life? So, like, can you, um, do you... Do you ever check messages online during the day from Tinder or, or, or dating apps whilst you're in working hours? Uh, that would be a kind of yes, I think. What are the potential consequences of your sexual behaviour if it's public knowledge? Well, most people would be embarrassed if it was public knowledge about what they liked to do or what they fantasised about. Um, what impact does, this, does your sexual behaviour have on your sense of self-worth? Um, 
Do you feel bad about being single? Do you feel bad about having casual sex, for example? Um, it's, it's quite easy to meet the criteria that's laid down if we think about behaviour in this way, I think. And I think that that's problematic. So I just wanted to kind of start us off with that. Mm, yeah, get a sense of it. So, yeah, I'm just going to um, kind of go back to thinking about how, where we're at with sex addiction sort of culturally and where this idea comes from. So I just did a bit of a Google search and this is some of the stuff that came up. But, you know, you'll probably have come across these kind of news articles yourself. And uh, Henry was just saying, actually, there was one in the Independent only today saying that porn was causing erectile dysfunction in young men and that it was interfering with their relationships and their sex lives. So that's a kind of pretty good example of the kind of news reporting you see in this area. Um, and you can see in the Newsweek when uh, sex addiction is often being hailed as an epidemic um, and many organisations being set up to kind of address sex addiction, including 12-step programmes for sex addiction and sex and love addiction. Um, and there tends to be particular attention on porn addiction. So that seems the sort of subset of sex addiction, but the one that perhaps gets the most coverage. Um, and it's often very gendered, with it seem that men are, men are the ones who are at risk of porn addiction, addiction to sex work and casual sex, whereas women being seen as more um, the sex and love addiction, um, emotional attachment side of things. Um, so, I mean, we're not saying sex addiction doesn't exist and, not, and loads of people aren't struggling with this kind of thing, because clearly a lot of people are struggling with this kind of stuff, and Dominic and I definitely see people struggling with these things in our therapy rooms. But I think, I mean, for me, when it's uh, an individual talking about the label sex addict, I'm not trying to say to them, that's wrong, you shouldn't call yourself a sex addict. What I would tend to do is just explore with them, what does that label open up, but also what does it close down for you? And frequently you find for people that actually there's a, there's a real um, positive in having a label like that because it suggests, well, this is a real thing. You know, there's a bit of a kind of disease model in that. That means maybe it's not my fault, I'm not a bad person. Um, there's a way of finding support uh, for, for the problem because you can Google it and find people talking about it um, and also finding other people who share the issues. Uh, again, in terms of what's closed down for a lot of clients by the concept of being a sex addict is they often feel they might get stuck in that, like, you know, once, once an addict, always an addict kind of, kind of idea that they're never going to not be a sex addict. Um, and also some feeling that conf a confusion when they come across other people who actually experience it very differently. Maybe it's rather an umbrella term for lots of different things rather than one thing that everyone experiences identically. And also a sense that maybe you have to follow a certain therapeutic path in order to, um, to deal with the sex addiction, perhaps one that they themselves don't really feel drawn to. So that's just an example of sort of the kind of thinking I would like to apply to this area, the crit critical thinking really. Um, it's certainly the case that sex addiction, is, uh, sex addiction therapy is big business. So I looked on the counselling directory and 8,000 counsellors in this country were listing themselves as working with sex addiction. And there's also several specialist sex addiction clinics which often charge an awful amount for therapy. <laughs> so it's worth you know, thinking about the, the business side of it as well. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Yeah. So... Um, just check in where... Oh, yeah, then uh, it's the ASEC one. OK. So I had a bit of a row with COSRAT over this one. COSRAT's the um, UK Sex and Relationship Therapy Organisation. Um, and on their website, uh, they, they listed um, kind of thing that... Well, they had, they had a whole section on sex addiction, basically. And I was really, like, unhappy with it. And we kind of had a bit of a, a, bit of a to and fro about it. And they do admit that the term is controversial... But they say the internet has facilitated the accessibility of sex, so they really, they really link sex addiction and the internet, as do a lot of the media reports. Um, they say, you know, enjoying an active sex life doesn't mean you're addicted. Um, it's only if it's out of control, and it's only if it's interfering with your relationships. However, they then list a whole bunch of activities, which they say, many people can do these things and it's fine, however signs of sex addiction may include and then they list specific practices and this is the bit where I start to be really concerned because it's like compulsive masturbation, multiple affairs, multiple or anonymous sexual partners and or one night stands, consistent use of pornography, unsafe sex, phone or computer sex, prostitution or the use of prostitutes, they use that word rather than sex workers, 
exhibitionism, voyeurism, and then sexual harassment and law-breaking. So a couple of non-consensual ones at the end. But the other things they list are all consensual sexual behaviours. And I just feel like it starts to set up a, an idea of, you know, what are the potentially addictive forms of sex <coughs> versus what are the healthy forms of sex. And it's kind of saying, well, coupled sex is fine, but solo sex is a bit dodgy. Um, monogamous sex is fine, but non-monogamous sex is a bit dodgy. Um, uh, sex, when it's in the loving context, is fine, but casual <coughs> sex, a bit dodgy. Um, anything in real life is fine, but if it's porn, it's a bit dodgy. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Certainly, transactional sex is more dodgy than, than that which doesn't involve you know, passing, passing hands. So, I think this is the kind of, uh, uh, Dominic will pick up on this more, but you start to get this sense of which forms of sex are dangerous to it or risky towards addiction, and which are kind of seen as being okay. And have you got the ASEC one next? Mm. Did you want to just say that? Okay. Yeah. So, so just yesterday, or the night before yesterday, in fact, um, in America, the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, which is ASECT, is the American equivalent of, of COSRA, I guess, uh, they issued a position statement on sex addiction. And uh, this is just a quote from the, the end of it. It's a relatively short statement, and I put the URL up there so that you can see the whole thing. But it, it is the position of ASECT that linking problems related to sexual urges, thoughts, or behaviours to a porn or sexual addiction process cannot be advanced by ASECT as a standard of practice for sexuality education, delivery, counselling or therapy. Um, and so uh, they're, they're saying very clearly there yeah. that um, you, you, people who are, are kind of being pathologised because of their urges or their thoughts or their behaviours, it's not helpful uh, to, to, uh, to try to treat that just as a behavioural addiction. And the evidence for it being a behavioural addiction is, is pretty non-existent, although very popular within the... Um, within the kind of pop psychology press. Yeah. I've, I've actually oh, put that slide list. in the wrong yeah. place, <laughs> haven't I? I think we sort of went through that one, so we go on to the next one. I mean, so that just gives you a flavour of where we're at now, I suppose, in terms of, well, there's Cosrat's kind of website position on it, there's the ASECT one, clearly they're quite different. So it's, it's an area of some controversy and some difference in, in views. But where it comes from, I just wanted to touch on in this slide. Um, Do you want that, that one or that Yeah, one? The, the, the one with the books on? The books. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't need the... Mm. Um, so yeah, it was um, the, the Patrick Kahn's book, Out of the Shadows, came out in the 1980s. And it was really him who um, introduced the idea. He was a prison psychologist, and he, he felt that a lot of the prisoners he was working with who had sexual problems, it looked an awful lot like the ones he was working with who had chemical dependency and, and drug addiction. So he was noticing similarities, and that's what got him working in this area. Um, then when the, the DSM-5 that's in the middle there, so that's the most recent edition of the American Psychiatric Association's kind of Bible of Psychiatric Disorders, um, there was a big conversation about whether hypersexual disorder was going to be included, which would be that kind of their version of sex addiction, and the decision was taken not to include it in the most recent version. So it isn't in the DSM. There is no disorder um, that would map onto sex addiction in there. Um, uh, but more and more people are seeking help for unwanted sexual behaviours, and Paula Hall, in a, a recent article, has said that about 3 to 6% of people see themselves as sex addicts and that the figure may be a lot higher. And also that there were 27,000 Google searches for sex or porn addiction every day. 27,000, and not all of those would be to prepare for presentations like this one, so <laughs> clearly, clearly there's a lot of interest in this area. Um, um, and a lot of the popular theories are quite evolutionary biolog biological, so one that I got from that, the Paula Hall article that I looked at was the, the evolutionary theory that porn is what they call a supernormal stimulus. Um, so it's kind of, um, the, uh, uh, she used the analogy with sugar, so like when, when back in a time when we didn't get um, food very, very easily, when we did find food we needed to binge on it. 
and the argument is that sugar today, people binge on it because it's readily available, but our, our impulse has evolved at a time when it wasn't readily available, and we're still going back to those evolutionary impulses. And the argument from the, the porn addiction people is that porn's rather similar, that for men at least, there's an impulse to widen the gene pool by having sex, particularly in what they call situations of erotic novelty. Um, and so therefore, again, porn is giving people all of this erotic novelty that they wouldn't have got back in the, the cave days. And that's why, you know, people are drawn to just keep, keep going, keep going, keep going with the porn. Um, we'll maybe come back to critiquing some of those theories, but I wanted to present what they are first. And if you want to go on a couple, actually, because we've sort of covered that. Right. Yeah, to the, right. that one, yeah. Um, so this just gives you a little bit more of the... The Paula, Paula Hall's approach, which um, she draws on this Griffiths components model, so it's asking these following questions. Is it, is it salient? Is the, is the client preoccupied and craving? Does it, is it used to manage emotions, which we already touched on? Is it, does it escalate over time? Do people come tolerant to it? You see the same language as for drug addiction with tolerance and also withdrawal. Do people experience withdrawal symptoms? And then does it call, cause any conflict? <coughs> And then she also has this model here that this is kind of how the process works for somebody who's <coughs> addicted to sex, is that trigger situations will kind of get them back into it, even though they haven't been doing it for a while. Um, and that might be, triggers could be just the environmental availability of suddenly finding yourself alone in a hotel room uh, with access to porn, for example, or it might be an emotional <coughs> trigger of stuff's going wrong in life, therefore I want to start doing this. And then that means people start preparing and then acting out, actually doing the sex addiction, but afterwards they regret it. And this reconstitution bit is that they're trying to stop themselves from doing it again at that point, and then it goes into this phase of dormancy. But Paula Hall's view is that if you haven't addressed the underlying issues, then it, it will just keep going round and round this circle. And we're going to come back to that model later, because I think that it is quite an interesting one. But again, you see how it's kind of taken drug and alcohol addiction and kind of mapped it onto sex and porn there. So, over to Dominic. <coughs> OK. So, so how has sex addiction been criticised? Um, well, firstly, there is no such thing as sex addiction. It isn't a diagnosis. It isn't a mental health diagnosis. There's no agreed criteria. Um, there's no evidence-based treatments, although there's lots of people trying various things, often to encourage people to, be, to stop engaging in sex and, and celibacy contracts. Um, the non-heteronormative sexual behaviours are pathologised, so as, as Meg John was saying, sex outside a monogamous relationship, um, kinky sex, BDSM, uh, porn, sex with strangers, casual sex, Sex in public places or group sex, even if these things are just, well, and these, these things are just consensual, these are seen as being problematic. Um, trading sex or paying for sex, and lots of people trade for sex. Um, you know, they go out for dinner, they bought a lovely dinner, and then there's the sex at the end of that. Um, and uh, dating sites and sex app memberships, and if you want to use sites in order to meet people nowadays, if you want. You, you get fuller function, you get premium membership, you get more opportunities if you pay for, if you pay for a membership because the software developers have written the code and, and they want to be compensated for that. So, so, but if you do any of those things, then, then you're engaging in behaviours that are seen to be dangerous um, and are likely to be pathologised for it. And it's a very superficial diagnosis. Someone presents and says, I'm a sex addict because I did a test or I saw a thing online and I... And so I, you know, people don't go to a doctor and say, I have cancer, and the doctor says, okay, well, we'll just begin treatment then. We, do, we can just bypass all the, all the tests and investigations for this. I'll just accept your diagnosis and we'll start with treatment. We don't do that, but when people come in with sex addiction, many psychologists will sit down and say, oh, okay, yes, tell me about that, and then just agree with that without doing any kind of assessment process. Um, and, and it's really important to, to do that because there may be other, deeper, underlying psychopathologies that are going to get missed. For example, people who are bipolar may be having a lot of sex in their manic phase. And if you don't know how to diagnose for that, then you miss that and it just goes untreated, which might be accounting for why people relapse 
because they're, they're, um, they're, uh, the mental health problems are not being spotted. People with borderline personality disorder may well have a lot of sex. Um, and there are other personality disorders, and people with, some people with OCD, forms of, some forms of OCD, might be having a lot of sex. Or collecting a lot of porn. Or collecting a lot yeah. of porn. And it gets seen as, um, you know, it gets, just gets, gets treated at the level of behaviour. I'm engaging in casual sex with strangers, um, and I'm doing this three or four times a week. Well, if you were doing that with a partner three or four times a week, that would be seen as okay. If you're doing that with three different partners, and you don't have a regular partner, then you're, then you're seen as being promiscuous and in need of treatment. And so it's really very important that it's not just in the lay, hands of lay people to be doing this kind of treatment and diagnose. Um, it, it, needs, it needs to be assessed very carefully first, because otherwise things will get missed. Um, and sex takes place in a... In a the, so the dominant discourse about sex is that sex takes place in a social context. And, this, and, and that this context is culture-specific and dynamic. Now, a lot of the writing that Patrick <coughs> Carnes did was writing uh, about a heterosexual milieu affecting heterosexual men, where the expectation is that they only have sex with their wives. Um, now, it doesn't really overlay very well on terms of gay men's sexuality, because the social context around gay men's sexuality is pretty different. Um, and it's interesting, one of the things that we didn't, we didn't say was he started his idea around sex addiction in the early 1980s, and that was the time when the AIDS epidemic was breaking out. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there is a link between those two things. Um, <coughs> sex is best enjoyed, the idea, there's an idea that sex is best enjoyed by two people, ideally a man and a woman, and that they should be in a committed relationship where they love each other, um, and that they commit to a monogamous relationship, and that there's this idea that a monogamy gets privileged, um, and that they have sex, um, and they have sex or make love because making love is seen as better than having sex, uh, but they mustn't do it too frequently. Um, they must do it frequently enough. But you must do it frequently <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> and, and, and there are ideas, and I think lots of people hold ideas that sex is dangerous that it unleashes intense libidinal feelings and feeling out of control, and that people are helpless to control their desires and their passions. Um, and, and so that's how some people get away with saying, well, I, it wasn't me, I'm a sex addict. You know, when they get caught, it's like, well, I, was, I, I, I have a sex addiction, I'm going to go to a clinic. It wasn't really me that did this. Um, I can't help myself. And actually, it helps people avoid taking responsibility for their own actions. And I, I, I'm not sure that that's, that's very helpful. Other dominant discourses um, is that it, uh, that it de devalues and excludes those who are single. Religious and moral beliefs are outside of the, that are outside of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So people without a regular partner are often left feeling inadequate and unentitled to sexual expression, either on their own, because frequent masturbation would be pathologized or disparaged, or with casual partners. And our society is geared to a dyad, and in so many ways, even in the supermarket, it's a ridiculous example, but in the <laughs> supermarket, there are meals for two. It's really hard to get meals for one, you know, for one or for three. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're so built in our society around we've got to privilege the dyad and everything must come and in pairs. But not all religions favour monogamy. Um, the Muslims, Mormons and many others might adopt non-monogamous or poly lifestyles as part of their cultural values. Uh, others are choosing a variety of forms of non-monogamy and if you want to know more about those many forms of non-monogamy, Meg John has a video on the Pink Therapy UK site, on, well now YouTube channel, that, that goes into this from, from one of our conferences a couple of years back. So Pink Therapy UK on YouTube will be an interesting thing to check out. Um, it misses the point that sex is fun and highly pleasurable. Uh, and those people who participate in sex just for pleasure are made to feel bad or ashamed but for enjoying it. It's, um, and, and also people who, are, who may lack the relationship skills or haven't learned to how to have relationships may be made to feel inadequate for being sexually active and single and horny. 
Um, and certainly when uh, you know, my peers were dating, my heterosexual peers were dating, that wasn't an option available to me. And so you, I, th I think people can miss out on some of those, some of those skills and, and some of those experiences at an age-appropriate time. This is from the appendix uh, that was proposed to go into the DSM-5. So this is taking us back a little bit historically, because as Meg John has said, hypersexual disorder didn't get included. But when they were talking about putting it in, they put this note in the appendix, and it says there is a significant clinical need, even a demand, from mental health consumers for mental health providers to recognize and diagnose a distinct group of men and women who have been seeking and are already receiving mental health care, such as individual psychotherapy, 12-step group support, pharmacotherapy, and specialized residential treatments. Now, so there's a market. People are coming in worried about it. So there's a market here. We can treat it. If we make a diagnosis, then we'll be able to get paid for it. And I don't think that's a very good just justification or rationalisation. And the APA, as, as Meg John said, found that there was insufficient validated research evidence that had consistent criteria and outcomes. I've got an alternative model, and if we were to put, the, put this forward to the DSM-6 committee, I think it might, be, um, it might, it might float and, and be, be useful for many people. So if diagnosis and treatment are going to remain as for mental health problems and remain a cornerstone of psychology, then we could save our time and energy on trying, instead of trying to define what is sex addiction and hypersexuality, we could, we could look for sexual shame. And the diagnostic tests for sexual shame could be the same tests that we've just been doing here because people are made to feel ashamed if they, if they tick yes for some of those things. So that would be criteria A. And, and but, but some people have come in and they have, feel like they've got, they're at an extreme end of things. Um, so we would want to do specific population studies to, to decide what, what is actually normative for this population. If someone is involved in, in hardcore spanking and, and corporal punishment, it would be much more useful to go and ask a, a population of people who are really big into spanking is this behaviour, is this frequency, is this intensity pathological and are you, would you be worried if people were doing that? Or is that normal? Rather than to asking a sex therapist or a psychologist who knows nothing about that community and what level of BDSM spanking would be acceptable. Um, so if we, could, if we could establish what would be normative data rather than asking the Daily Mail or a psychiatrist, we might get <laughs> a better answer. And then the, first, the last part is the standard criteria that you get in a DSM, which is if it causes you concern, then it's diagnosable. And I think we could diagnose lots of people with sexual shame disorder. And actually, as therapists, we treat shame all the time, and we know how to do that. So we can leave aside the behaviour, and we can treat the person for the shame. And I think that that could be a, a helpful intervention. I, I also think that this is a, a, a helpful model. Mm. This is Doug Braun Harvey's and Michael Vigorito's sexual health model. And they are, se they are sex therapists and psychologists. And in fact, Doug is coming to the UK to run a workshop for Pink Therapy on Friday the 24th of March um, about his book, Treating Out of Control Sexual Behaviour. So 24th of March, and there's an early bird discount that runs out on the 20th of December. So it's very timely that you're hearing this news today. And, and what he does, and I'm only going to skate over a very, you know, a very sophisticated model because there isn't a lot of time, but what he does is he looks for principles of sexual health. He's kind of these six underlying principles. So is the sex that you're having consensual? Well, if, it's, if, 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 if everyone's consenting, it's not a problem, Yeah. If it's non-consensual, then yes, you've got something, to, a reason to be sitting in my room. Let's talk about it. Is it non-exploitative? Yeah? If you're taking advantage of vulnerable people, that's something that needs treating. But if it's not exploiting anybody, then that's okay. Are you pr using protection from HIV and STIs and unwanted pregnancies, unintended pregnancies? 
If you're having a lot of unsafe sex, then that's a problem, and we should be talking about that behaviour and trying to look at why you're putting yourself at risk and other people at risk. Um, and, you know, there is a tendency for um, people to, for some men, to say, oh, I don't want to use condoms at all, they, they kill my erection, I don't, they, don't, they don't help with sensation, so they're kind of insisting that they don't get to use condoms. Uh, but that might be putting their partner at risk, it might be putting them at risk too. So protection from HIV and STIs is, is a principle. Honesty is a principle. So people being, and, and shared values, so people cheating on their partner, they've got a, they've got, they, they might espouse to monogamy, but then they're having these illicit affairs on the side. That's a problem. And, and he, 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 um, he has a term of sexual narcissism, which is a kind of exploitativeness and a lack of empathy, which only appears contextually in certain sex, in sexual situations. And it's the narcissism rather than the addiction which is often the cause of infidelity and sexual deceit. And that is something that should be treated, or, or could be treated. How is it that you feel that you have a right to cheat on your partner, but you expect them to be monogamous with you? Yeah? So there are things, there are sexual behaviours that I think are, um, can be out of control, but I'm not sure that I, I agree with the kind of idea of compulsivity and addiction. Um, and shared, shared values are important. I've talked, you know, I've talked a bit about that. There, there needs to be congru congruence and consistency between our values and our behaviour so that we act with integrity and honesty and negotiate the model for our relationships that will work for all the people involved in the relationship and not just for one of the partners who thinks that they can get away with doing what they like. Um, you know, if one partner is seeking sexual variety but the other is desiring exclusivity, we have a, both a shared values and an honesty problem. We're faced, what we're faced with here is a conflict between existential values, honesty and non-monogamy, versus attachment, a fear of losing one's partner. And, and um, Braun Harvey and Vigoriso describe this as existential pain. And it's something that can be worked with and talked about. And they make use of the dual model of sexuality, paying attention to the tension between excitation, so what gets us going and makes it, uh, and, and inhibition. And, and some people uh, who use uh, a lot of porn might feel scared of having sex with partners because they're worried that they're gonna lose their erection. So that's why they can stay, they feel confident to wank on the computer because they can masturbate safely and they don't have an erectile dysfunction when they're on the computer. But if they're in a, with a real life person, then there might not be enough stimulation for them or they might be too inhibited or too anxious, uh, lack sexual ed education, uh, lack enough information about the kind of anatomy of their partner if they're having sex with some of the opposite sex. Or the other, or the, or the other, other, <laughs> or the other things yes. that they could be doing. Yeah. Um, so he, he talks about very careful um, assessment processes. Um, he makes use of the adverse childhood experiences questionnaire. And I don't know if you're familiar with the research about the ACE, but it looks at um, childhood abuse, neglect, and trauma. And people often who have had really traumatic childhoods um, end up having chronic health concerns later on and or addictions later on in life. So that's, a, that's an important measure. Uh, he uses the a sexual symptom assessment scale, which is a 12 item measuring, um, measures changes in compulsive sexual behavior symptoms. He uses the hypersexual behavior consequences scale, which is more detail reviewing, exploring consequences as perceived by the client on their behavior. Um, and these are, these, are, these are tests that people can do online and, and, and take themselves through it. And if they're in treatment with him, they, they would be doing some of these things every every week they came in order to kind of tune into where their progress is at. And he does a lot of group therapy around this issue. And then there's an interesting one which is the sexual inhibition scale and the sexual excitation scale. And there's two scales for the CIS. The CIS one is threats due to performance and failure, so the, the fear of it not working out. And the other is that the CIS two is, is around threats to performance consequences. Um, like being caught, being worried about being found out. Um, and so these are inhibitory scales. 
and then there's an excitation scale. And you can get, um, so you can get to look at those on the Kinsey Institute research website um, and, and look at inhibition and excitation and Kinsey and you'll find that. Oh, it's gone pink again. No, we're pink again. <laughs> Sorry about that. And we think the bulb is on the way out. Um, we're also thinking about experience, he's also interested in looking at people's experiencing their close relationships. So looking at nine attachment based questions in relation to their attachment with their mother, their father, a close friend, and a romantic partner. And plotting that on four axes uh, related to anxiety and avoidance, secure, fearful, preoccupied, and dismissive. And kind of mapping that one out. And that brings out a picture of some more information. A little bit heteronormative. Yeah. Everyone's got a mother. Not, well, it's primary carers, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's primary carers. Um, and uh, attachment, and, 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 and also people who have attachment deficit or hyperactivity disorder may have, may have issues around concentrating um, and staying focused in the, in the context of sex and the relationship. So they need a lot of stimulation. And porn, for example, would provide a lot of stimulation. So he says effective self-regulation requires clear and well-defined standards because ambiguous, uncertain, inconsistent or conflicting standards make self-regulation difficult. And I think, that's, I think that's quite interesting. So if you want to know more about a sexual health model for working with, with um, people who have got out-of-control sexual behaviour, I really would encourage you to come and book for... You can just come into his day rather than stay and do our, the conference on the, the following days around gay men. But, I mean, you get a discount if you do both days. But that's a, I'll put a URL up at the end for, so you can take the details down. But Meg John's got some... <laughs> some ideas. <laughs> some really interesting new ideas, and you're one of the first people to hear them. Yeah, um, well, I just wanted to also to pick up what strikes me about the model we've just heard about and how it's different from the, the more diagnosis-based models and the, the questionnaires we looked at earlier, especially the COSRAT one, is those, those ones seem to be a lot about what do people do and how much do they do it, whereas the, the, the model you just presented is very much about how people do it. It's like anything can be okay if you're doing it in this ethical, honest, mm -hmm. uh, self-aware, mm -hmm. mutually pleasurable kind of way. Yep. And I, prefer, I think that's you know, a really interesting shift and perhaps yeah. a key element. <coughs> also, I think we've got to think about the difference between something that's very individualistic, which is about this individual having a problem, versus models that take account of the wider culture. Because you do have to ask yourself, you know, would some of these things be a problem if the, if the wider culture wasn't telling people that it wasn't okay? And that's been a key issue in terms of diagnosis of homosexuality back in the day when that used to be in the DSM and, and kink and BDSM, which is still in the DSM. You know, it's always got this line about if it causes people concern or interpersonal difficulties or whatever. But the, the question is, well, if the culture was really okay with this thing, would that person then be all right themselves? If the culture didn't demonize porn, would that person viewing porn actually find a fairly okay relationship with porn? Is it, is it actually the fact that the culture is viewing it in a negative way that, that means that it becomes a much bigger problem is an important question as well. So yeah, just to, to finish, I, I just came up with this kind of series of questions that I thought would be a bit more useful to ask in this area than, than the one, a lot of the ones I see being asked. Um, one is, what if we started from a place of personal reflection rather than a desire to help those poor people? You know, I'm big on like therapists not seeing it as a them and us, therapists and clients. We all engage in sexual fantasy in some kind of way, probably, or at least most people do, um, or erotic fantasy or some kind of imagination um, around these areas. And so we need to think about self-exploration of those areas and understanding ourselves before we let go and kind of offer these things to clients, I think. Um, also, what if we considered all forms of engagement with sexual imagery together? So um, the people who write the porn studies journal, Clarissa, uh, Clarissa Smith and Fiona Atwood, uh, really challenge this idea that there are these kind of good versions of erotica and the bad versions. You know, we often have that split of porn and erotica. What makes the difference? Well, often it's you know, very much a personal point of view of what counts as porn and what counts as erotica. But if we're going to, you know, let, let's think critically about why we draw those kind of lines, I guess, and maybe think about porn, reading erotica, um, 
uh, having fantasies, maybe even romance fiction, mm -hmm. as kind of in the same, the kind of same territory. And why are people drawn to these things? And finding out uh, that kind of answer for, for across all of them. Also, existential therapy, which I trained in, always assumes that everything that we do is sensible. So what if our starting point was, whatever this person's doing, it's sensible, let's find out how it makes sense to that person, rather than, here's a random weird person thing this person's doing, let's stop them doing it. And I think Paula Hall you know, does, does have that in the, the paper that I read, you know, that it, there is an idea of needing to get to the underlying um, kind of reasons, but some of the other people we've heard about, it's very much just stop the behaviour without really understanding what it means to the person. And then I ask, you know, what if, what if we assumed that we might be able to learn something for our, from our engagement with porn and erotica and fantasy, rather than again coming from this negative point of view of it's a bad thing that interferes with our lives. Maybe there's some, really something in there that could be valuable to people if they were to tune into it and look at it more carefully. And also, how might we then more ethically and creatively engage with pornography, erotica, or fantasy um, if we were kind of being more self-aware about it? And that kind of goes on to the next slide, I guess. Um, so the first, when I first started thinking about all of these questions, it was when I was writing the book on mindfulness there, mindful counselling and psychotherapy. And um, the, I'm really interested in the Buddhist perspective on all of this because they really wouldn't... They, they really think that everyone is an addict. You know, Buddhism is about saying that we, we suffer because we crave for things, and it wouldn't really tease out sex addiction and porn addiction from everything else that we do that's addiction. And basically, we're all trying to get all of what we want and you know, get all the pleasure and get rid of all of the pain, and that means that we constantly get hooked into certain habits. And you know, it wouldn't make a real distinction between craving for people to like us or craving for work success or other kinds of self-soothing that we do through face, going on Facebook all the time or watching telly all the time. You know, plenty of people view three hours of TV every night and, and it, that isn't seen as a problem. So I think that, that that's an important perspective in here of why do certain things get seen as a problematic addiction? And certainly from the mindfulness perspective, it would have really separate out different things. <coughs> And then generally from mindfulness perspective is that we try and, if things, are, if things are an issue, we try and approach them rather than avoid them. So again, the approach would be different from a kind of abstinence, let's just cut it out model, but rather let's, let's approach this. And there's this idea that in addiction in mindfulness called urge surfing, is, which I've really found helpful with clients, where you kind of, in, when the urge comes upon you, you try and sit with it for a while. And you might well still go into it and do the thing. Can you like sit with that desire to, to turn on the porn you know, just for a minute before you do and see what's coming up for you and how do you feel in your body? And that kind of question is really helpful because people start to then understand, oh, so it always, it's always when I'm feeling like this. Okay, that, that's really useful, useful information. And then you can actually get into the content of it that way as well. So I would encourage clients not to stop what they're doing but to start bringing in a kind of mindful awareness so they're just doing it with more awareness and they think, oh, okay, I find, I notice that I start looking at this stuff and then I go and start looking at this stuff and this is the, this is the process through it and this is how long it tends to last and, you know, they start to get a bit more understanding and I think, again, the cultural attitude towards these things almost stops people doing that because it's just, you're doing a bad thing and so people just kind of go into a bit of a black hole with it and they're not thinking about it because they, they, they know they're going to feel bad and regret it afterwards. Whereas if you can kind of say, isn't this interesting? Let's do it in a kind of less judgmental way. Let's, let's just really engage with it. And then, yeah, the, so the last bit of what I've been doing is called um, also erotic ethnography. So this idea that I think we should all be thinking about how do we engage with this stuff. And now for me, it's not porn. It's not been, never been porn, but it has been erotic fantasy my whole life. So over the summer, I wrote this weird book, which I don't know if I'll ever publish, but it's like a memoir of my life and my erotic fantasies and how they changed over time. And it's also a self-help book. So through that exploration, I was thinking, well, what kind of self-help activities would be useful for a client if they wanted to engage, again, with their use of fantasy or erotica or porn, whichever it be, in the same kind of way? And I, I, I mean, I learned just a million things by doing this. It was such an interesting process. But a couple of the ones I just wanted to pull out is drawing on um, Jack Marin's work in the erotic mind. So 
Uh, it's an excellent book if you haven't read it. And his suggestion is that our fantasies are often survival strategies to help us get through the tough times in childhood. And mine certainly are. It's like when you look at it from that point of view, it's kind of blatant and obvious. You're like, oh, these are not that complex, actually. <laughs> it's like I had that shaming experience, and then the fantasy was it was all worked out nicely in the end and quite quite horny in the end. You know, so it, that, that's quite a common trope, really, in people's sexual fantasies. Um, so basically, you know, the idea I get from Marin is if we, if we really let ourselves um, investigate, again, curiously and compassionately our fantasies, we might learn a great deal about ourselves and about our habits, so about how we treat ourselves, how we treat other people, um, what we're driven by. And, uh, you know, I think for me, it's, it's all in there, actually. It's a great route, a bit like dreams, you know, how dreams can be a real route into self-understanding. I think we can treat fantasies in the same way. And, and I think erotica and porn, you know, have the same, they have stories in them, they have characters in them, so we can treat those in a similar way too. And the other really uh, useful thing I found was thinking uh, about this, this idea from John Rowan and Mick Cooper about subpersonalities, how we all have different sides to ourselves. This I found really helpful with clients, because clients can often be pretty wigged out by the kind of thing they're thinking about fantasizing about, particularly if it's kind of got power in it or being, being mean to people in it or even hurting people in it, um, if that's what they're looking at in porn or that's what they're fantasizing about. But these guys would suggest we have these different sides to ourselves, um, almost like different characters within us. And some of them we're taught are okay and they kind of come to the fore in our lives and others we quite, we quite disown. And what struck me doing this project was like a lot of the fantasy characters are the kind of disowned parts of me. And it was really useful to think of fantasy as a way of engaging those parts and getting to know them better, which is pretty much what Rowan and Cooper are suggesting we need to do with these sides of ourselves, although nobody in that book suggests doing it by having <laughs> sexual fantasies or watching porn. Um, but the client I worked with who was really struggling with porn, what he found when he started to think about it in this way was that he'd always assumed he was like the, the dominant powerful one in the porn videos he was watching, that that was who he was identifying with and it scared him that he might be wanting to do nasty things to somebody. But when he actually started engaging with it in a more self-aware way, he realised he identified with the person having it done. And it really related it back to times in his life where he'd been powerless. And it was a complete revelation to him. And that's the quality of it. That's what I find. It's like, mm. if you just fantasise, watch porn, read erotica without ever thinking about it in this way, you have all these kind of assumptions about kind of why you're a bad person because of it, or, you know, you, you're, you're scared to kind of look at it too closely for what it might reveal. When you actually kind of lift that veil and look at it, you, you, it's kind of revelation, revelation. This is so useful, do you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, you, and you build more self-compassion, I would think. So yes, that's my tentative. I'm going to write this up as a paper at some point, but you, you've heard it first. That's where I'm going with, with this whole area. <coughs> so if you want to stay in touch with us and or follow up on the uh, material, then there's some information there for you. Thanks very much for your attention. Let's take some questions. And I'll <laughs>